it, it does seem to be that it could have quite a catastrophic effect. Uh, we're talking about uh, global economic financial chaos is what's being described. And uh, I, I, I prefer not to play uh, roulette like that. The depths of human folly are fathomless. But we're talking about politicians now. So if the depths of human folly are fathomless, with politicians, it's even worse. Days by Washington's are floundering over averting economic disaster. China's calling for a de-Americanized world. U.S. default would strike a serious blow to the Asian powerhouse, which sits uh, on more than a trillion dollars in U.S. treasuries. Now, China expert Andrew Liang says uh, Beijing's already cutting loose from its binding burden. The situation is changing um, because um, uh, China's uh, surplus and foreign currency reserve is mounting and the U.S. Um, uh, seems to be printing money uh, with no end in sight. The U.S. dollar has lost um, a great deal of its value. We are seeing um, that China has set up uh, special uh, free trade zones um, to speed up the process of, um, uh, of the renminbi as an international currency. What's up, guys? Uh, we're at one of the worst times in American history where uh, there is a major standoff in the White House and in Congress. But they just passed a bill here a few days ago where uh, they tried to uh, reopen the government for the people's sake. But unbeknownst to this one guy, or I guess I wouldn't say unbeknownst, the Republicans passed a law that would uh, refute us reopening our government and going back to somewhat normal so they could uh, figure some stuff out. That's why I do not support Democrats nor Republicans. They're both out to destroy us and they're the worst thing that's ever happened in our country. All it does is divide us. But this is pretty pitiful and if you don't want to watch the beginning you can fast forward to like two minutes and something it really starts getting good but I cannot believe this. They pass a law against the will of the own people to uh, reopen the government and get going and get s stuff going. I don't know what's going to happen in the next few days. Hopefully they'll figure something out. But this Thursday, it's going to be a very important day, or I guess uh, maybe Wednesday at midnight. But wow. What purpose does the gentleman from Maryland rise? Uh, Mr. Speaker, pursuant to Clause 4 of Rule 22, I move that the House take from the Speaker's table the Senate amendment to the House Joint Resolution 59, recede from its amendment, and concur in the Senate amendment to open the government now. Under Section 2 of House Resolution 368, the, that motion may be offered only by the Majority Leader or his designee. A parliamentary inquiry, uh, Mr. Gentlemen Speaker. Gentlemen may state his parliamentary inquiry. The standing rule of the House is Rule 22, Clause 4. Is that correct? That is correct. And the standing rule of the House reads, Mr. Speaker, when the stage of disagreement has been reached between, reached on a bill or a resolution with House or Senate amendments, a motion to dispose of any amendment shall be privileged. Mr. Speaker, my question is, is this parliamentary status of the bill, does this, does it meet the requirements of 22-4? The House has altered that operation of that standing rule. So I just want to understand, Mr. Speaker, this, this standing rule of the House, which I have here, has been altered by the House. Is that what the Speaker is saying? The House adopted a resolution altering. A parliamentary inquiry, Mr. Speaker. When, when was that alteration made? House Resolution 368. House Resolution 368, Mr. Speaker, just parliamentary inquiry. I want to make sure I have the right one. I have in my hand HRES 368, October 1st, resolved, and Section 2 of that says any motion pursuant to Clause 4 of Rule 22 relating to the House joint resolution may be offered only by the majority leader or his designee. Is that what you're referring to, Mr. Speaker? That is the resolution. 
So, Mr. Speaker, just, just so I understand the situation, parliamentary inquiry, HRES 368 changed the standing rules of the House to take away from any member of the House the privilege of calling up the Senate bill to immediately reopen the government. Is that right? It did change the operation of the standing rule. Right. So, just parliamentary inquiry, a, a privileged motion, Mr. Speaker, would have allowed any member of this House, Republican or Democrat, to call up the Senate bill to open the government. Is that right? The Chair did not give an advisory opinion on that. But, Mr. Speaker, a, a, a privileged revel resolution, as cited in Rule 22-4, the standing rules of the House, would allow any member of the House to offer that resolution. Is that right? The Chair will not give an advisory opinion. Well, Mr. Speaker, parliamentary inquiry, I, I, I think you just, as I understood, said that that was changed so that it no longer would be a privileged motion for any member, but it would be exclusively the right of the Republican leader or his designee. Am I right about that? The House will follow House Resolution 368. Right. And ju just, just, just again, Mr. Speaker, I want to I be absolutely clear that HRES 368 changed the standing rules of the House so that only the Republican leader is, or his designee could call to open the, the government. The gentleman will state his parliamentary inquiry. Parliamentary inquiry. Parliamentary inquiry. Is the majority leader or his designee? I would ask my colleagues whether the majority leader or his designee is on the floor of the House today. The gentleman will address the parliamentary, parliamentary inquiry, Mr. Speaker. This rule. The chair which is, amended the, uh, the my, chair, my, my, my the, parliamentary inquiry, and this will be my last one. I just want to understand, Mr. Speaker. The Rules Committee, under the rules of the House, changed the standing rules of the House to take away the right of any member to move to uh, vote to open the government and gave that right exclusively to the Republican leader. Is that right? The House adopted that resolution. The resolution. The chair. The chair. I think, the, I think chair, that, the chair. That, the chair is now prepared to entertain one minute. I, I, I make my motion, Mr. Speaker. I, I renew my motion that under the regular standing rules of the House, Clause 4, 4, Rule 22, that the House take up the Senate amendments and open the government now. Under Section 2 of House Resolution 368, that motion may be offered only by the majority leader or his, his designee. And this, the, the the chair, Mr. Speaker, the why, gentleman, it, why the were the rules the gentleman, rigged to keep the, the government will shut down? The gentleman will suspend. Well, Mr. Speaker, the House, I think the chair will now entertain. Democracy has been suspended. The gentleman Mr. will suspend. The, the, the chair, Mr. Mr. Speaker, the why, gentleman, why the were the rules the rigged to keep the, the government shut down? The, the, the chair, Mr. Mr. Speaker, the why, the gentleman, why the were the rules the rigged to keep the, the government shut down? The We begin with breaking news that affects every American tonight. America's top credit rating is officially on the line. A major agency now threatening a downgrade, lowering America's sterling financial status in the world. And all because hardline members of Congress have brought the U.S. to the brink. So what does this mean for a frustrated nation tonight? We have two reports, starting with ABC's chief business correspondent, Rebecca Jarvis. It is a warning shot to the nation. Fitch, one of the major agencies that judges America's financial health, saying tonight that America's AAA credit, among the best in the world, is now in danger of being lowered because the political brinksmanship could increase the risk of a U.S. default. A startling warning that because of the showdown in Washington, America may not be able to pay what it owes. The deadline is looming. Rating agencies are talking about downgrading us as early as tonight, again. Two years ago, when one of the big agencies downgraded America, it triggered one of the worst days for your money in Wall Street's history. The Dow plummeting 635 points, a 401k worth $100,000 losing nearly 6,000 in just one day. Analysts say even if this time around America escapes its mess without a downgrade, the U.S. still facing serious issues ahead. 
Without a deal this week, experts warn of a domino effect. Not just the Dow plunging, but higher interest rates, more expensive mortgages and car loans, consumers spending less, leading to job loss. What happens Thursday if there is no deal? Thursday is going to be a very eerie day, something that we've never experienced before. If there is no deal, we will see significant pressure on our markets. Selling. Selling, absolutely. Think of it like this. America is now on probation, put there by one of the main watchdogs that tells the world whether it's safe to own our debt. The nation can be taken off probation, but historically speaking, these sorts of negative watches, they lead to downgrades, which can be very painful and costly for the country, Diane. And how long before they make up their mind? It could be as many as 90 days, or we could be here in three days with a decision. It could happen that fast. It could happen that fast. All right, Rebecca Jarvis, thank you. The head of the International Monetary Fund has warned that the combination of a U.S. government shutdown coupled with a default on the country's debt would result in a massive disruption that could threaten the entire global economic recovery. If there is that degree of disruption, that lack of certainty, that lack of trust in the U.S. signature, it would mean massive disruption the world over, and we would be at risk of tipping yet again into recession. Appearing on NBC's Meet the Press, the managing director of the International Monetary Fund said the U.S. must raise the debt ceiling. The deadline for the U.S. is Thursday. If the debt ceiling is not raised, Lagarde warned, then the country could default on its debt, roiling the world financial markets. Uh, you have to honor your signature. Uh, you have to give certainty to the rest of the world. And you have to make sure that your own economy is, is consolidating that welcome recovery that we have seen in the last few days because it impacts the entire economy. The U.S. government has been shut down for nearly two weeks as President Obama and House Republicans remain trapped in a fierce budget battle. This is Dabu7 with huge news concerning the mass displacement of millions of citizens in this country. Coming November 1st, the, the funding for Section 8 will dry up. Some of you may think, well, okay, it doesn't matter, I'm not on Section 8. Problem is, millions are. They have the money to make it through this month of October. But they will no longer be able to pay landlords through the rental assistance assistance program for low-income tenants come November 1st, as long as Congress does not reopen. So Congress has to re reopen for these people to keep their homes. This is huge. Okay, They state we had some funds flowing, but starting November 1st, however, we will not have those funds. We will not be able to make payments to landlords, and that could happen, and the eviction process could start, but they don't know. This is all pending on this shutdown. A lot is in play here. Now, they also go on to say that there's some 20,000 people inside of Massachusetts that get this Section 8 that alone will be affected, and they also go on to state that after October that there's no guarantees. They say that if they do not get the money, landlords may not find that they're going to get their payments. I mean, what do you guys think are going to happen if, you, if you're a landlord? What do you think some of these guys are going to do if they're not getting their payments or they see that they're not getting their payments from the government? They're going to shut it down. And they're going to evict people. Now, what also is going to take effect here is during the shutdown, winterization, heating, things like that done at government agencies are all put on hold. All these grants to all these other services and classes and, and schooling are all shut down. Okay? So, they also go on to say here that 
887,000 people benefit from SNAP and food stamps. And this is where it connects to the EBT, another phase of this. Due to the lapse in the funding, it says that they will uh, have the benefits continue through October. Okay, through October. But come November, like I stated in the last video, they are putting everything on hold. So you are seeing the potential here come November 1st for the mass displacement of millions of people. Millions of people. Like he says here, state programs for weatherization and heating system repair were not will not be able to function after November 1st. So this is huge. Huge implications. And they better figure something out quick. Because what they're saying here is that they're assuming that if the federal government shutdown continues through the month, it's going to directly impact the program and it will not get fuel assistance. Do you see where this is going toward a complete shutdown? I'll leave a link so you guys can see this, you know, for yourself, share it with others. But this is a direct attack going for Section 8 and people that are being housed by the government. Okay? As they state, I repeat, if the shutdown continues more than another week or two, we could be talking about mass displacement of millions of low-income tenants in a few weeks. Till next time, this has been Dapu7. Eyes open. Welcome back to the Ed Show. And finally tonight, chaos erupted in Georgia today. These pictures show the desperate situation millions of Americans are facing. Over the past three days, 30,000 people showed up outside of Atlanta just to get an application for public housing. Today, an estimated 10,000 people, 10,000 people, stood in the lines for hours in 90-degree heat. Dozens of people were treated for overheating. I, th this is just amazing. Last week on this program, I showed videotape of what it was like back in the 30s and how desperate people were. And recalled a story at the dinner table that my dad used to say how he went through the depression and that they had bread lines and whatnot. And, of course, we'd never see that again in this country. Can we see that tape again? Because there are things in place. I, I find this amazing. It was a security issue today. NBC's Ron Mott. He's live in East Point, Atlanta, tonight with us here on The Ed Show. Ron, what was it like down there today? Well, Ed, I've got to tell you, good evening uh, to start. I've got to tell you that the first thought that I had when we pulled up on the scene here was whether we were in America. And I have to be very careful as a reporter not to overstep my bounds. But this was a very disgusting scene that we saw here in Metro Atlanta today. Dozens upon dozens of people passing out from the heat, standing in the heat just to get an application to apply for public housing here in Metro Atlanta. This does not guarantee them a place to live. In fact, they had so many applications go out today, 13,000 applications. There are exactly zero public housing units, zero public subsidized housing units available in East Point, Georgia. A lot of these folks will never get off that wait list, and the executive director of the Housing Authority acknowledged that today. My first question to her was, could you not have come up with a, a more dignified process so these folks, many of whom are facing some of the worst times of their lives, could get out of the heat, could understand fully what they were getting into here today. They were, they were happy, I must tell you. They were pleased uh, beyond words to get these applications today because at least they get into the system and at least that gives them some measure of hope of getting into federally subsidized housing. But I got to tell you, today was not a good day for the folks who ran this. They should be embarrassed, I must say, by what unfolded out here with people passing out in the heat simply for a chance to get on a waiting list that could go for years and years before your name is cleared, Ed. Ron, was security an issue down down there today. Well, they had a lot of cops here. One of the questions I asked the, the, the city manager and the police chief is why in the world would you send police here in riot gear? That 
automatically will ratchet up some people's emotions to see that that's how the authorities are looking upon them. They did not have a whole lot of issues here. They did have one person apparently going through the crowd with a taser. We have no idea where he got this taser. We don't know who this man is. Police said they gave chase, but because this parking lot was just a chaotic scene, they did not find him. They also got a package delivered to the front steps of the housing authority. Turns out that it was a suitcase with a letter in it saying, please help me. I'd like to get some housing. They thought for a second there that they, there was a bomb or something called in. They had it checked out. Fortunately, it was not a bomb. This is how desperate these folks are here, Ed, and this is the treatment they got here today. Now, are most of these folks unemployed uh, and they're just destitute? Are they street folks? What about that? We don't know what the breakout was. Uh, my guess is that a number of these people were, in fact, employed. These are the working poor looking to get a break on their housing costs. Yeah. And that's what the Section 8 Federal Housing Subsidized Program is, is it's going to cover the difference between what your landlord wants for that piece of property and what you're able to afford. The government will step in and give you a voucher to pay the difference. But it is a program that has, has helped so many families across the country for years and years. But today, I, again, as I, say, as I say, I think they deserve better than what they got today in terms of these conditions out here. NBC's Ron Mott in East Point, Atlanta. Ron, thanks for that report tonight. And one can only imagine watching this videotape that we showed you earlier on this story. Um, how many other cities have it like this across America? And I think we have to ask the moral question, aren't we better than this? Tonight, in our tech survey, I asked, do you agree with Congressman Alan Grayson that Robert Gibbs should be fired? 55% of you said yes, 45% of you said no. That's The Ed Show. I'm Ed Schultz. For more information on The Ed Show, go to ed.msnbc.com or check out wegoted.com, my radio website. You can Bare shelves and empty food bins. It's about everything is gone. I've never seen uh, in, in, in that condition. Shopper Anthony Fuller says the big box store in Mansfield looked like someone raided it. He's not far off. Ivy buggies are gone. Hundreds packed both the Mansfield and Spring Hill Walmart Saturday night. Once word spread, they were accepting electronic benefit transfers or EBT cards with no limits. <laughs> in to control the crowds. Spring Hill Police Chief Will Lind says people piled their cars full of food for two hours. But when balances started showing up on cards again, people rushed out, abandoning their carts and leaving behind a huge mess. One man captured the aftermath with cell phone video. Man, this is real, bro. Oh, when we walked through the door, it looked like a tornado had came through. O.J. Evans and a friend were there to buy a t-shirt, but when they saw dozens of full and abandoned carts, he only thought one thing. I was just thinking Facebook and Instagram. The shield's empty. While he can be heard laughing in the video, <laughs> Evans says he felt bad for the employees that would have to restock the food. I was just thinking, oh my God, I'm so glad my mom doesn't work here anymore. Evans believed it was natural human reaction that led people to fill up their carts during the glitch. But couple Stan and Judy Garcia feel very differently. That's plain theft. That's stealing. That's all I got to say about it. We asked Walmart spokesperson Kayla Whaling if the company would be taking the loss on any food purchased on the carts not showing balances. Whaling would only say that they monitor transactions during the outage. Victoria Shirley, KSLA News 12.
This week, the United States House of Representatives passed a bill which would cut funding to the Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program, or food stamps. Oregon Congressman Greg Walden, who voted in favor of the cuts, says the program is growing too fast and needs to be changed. We begin tonight with an absolute eruption of shock and fury on the floor of the House of Representatives as Republicans jettisoned 47 million hungry Americans so they can get on with the business of shoveling more money into the hands of big agricultural and special interests. Since 1973, the Farm Bill has been crafted to yoke together the fates of the working poor, largely clustered in urban areas who depend on food stamps to avoid malnutrition, with farmers and the agricultural industry in America's hinterlands. It's a strange but oddly ingenious means of stitching together the two Americas. But today, Republicans in the House sawed them apart. Stripping the food stamp program from the Farm Bill entirely, a move that set off a monumental outburst of indignation from Democrats. Mr. Speaker, I have finally received a copy of the bill. It appears to have no nutrition title at all. Is this a printing error? After an embarrassing, chaotic defeat of their last proposal, they've decided to make a bad situation even worse. I can't wrap my mind around the shameful nature of this moment. You tell me how in the world we can have a farm bill and separate food and nutrition out from it. In decades, you have never separated the Supplemental Nutrition Program. I really am embarrassed uh, to say today that the trying to feed people could be a reason why they would stop the Farm Bill. The audacity to split off the nutrition parts of this bill is so stunning. It would be shocking, except this is a house of shocks. I would say it's one of the worst things you've done, but there's such stiff competition for that honor that I can't really fully say that. It was turned from a bipartisan bill into a partisan bill. All the folk want is a piece of a soundbite at home to say they believe in deficit reduction. They made a clear choice to project generous subsidies for agricultural corporations at the expense of the hungry and the working poor. This is not some little club. We are the Congress of the United States of America, the most powerful nation on this planet. And we can take care of all of the people. This is the lowest of the low. When we can't pass this, you know, ladies and gentlemen, they can't run the House. The only thing that this House will do when it votes today is defeat starving children. And you are taking food out of the mouths of your own poor constituents. H.R. 2642 is a dead beat majority's proposal. Enough already. Enough is enough. Vote Early no! Vote no! Vote no! It is ridiculous what you're doing to our children. Every single Democrat in the House did vote no today, along with 12 Republicans, but that was not enough to stop the Republican stripped down farm bill. It passed by an eight-vote margin, 216 to 208. Well, I think that we heard it from their own mouths today. I mean, the um, Sen uh, uh, Representative Sessions actually described um, those hardworking Americans as extraneous. And I did a hashtag, hashtag extraneous to the farm bill, as though somehow you really could separate farm from food for hungry people. And so they said it out of their own words. We didn't have to make it up today. They said it on the floor of the House of Representatives. They said to 47 million Americans across the country, we're not going to feed you even though we know you're hungry, and yet we're going to subsidize both ourselves and big corporate farmer, farming interests across this country. What then happens to these folks? I mean, the, today was an outrage. It was precedent breaking. What is next? I mean, there are so many people in this country that are dependent upon this program. What is the next move here? It's a central tendency in government to plan for the normal, and disasters aren't normal. They're going to be overwhelmed. They're not going to be ready for it. People are going to die, and there isn't a whole lot we're going to be able to do about it. They're saying that we're nine meals away from anarchy. You'll start to see a true disintegration of society. People will form together in gangs to go obtain the resources they need. They're going to be looking for food. They're going to be looking for drugs. There are going to be some grade A predators out there. Whoa, turn that off. 
Turn that off. Large urban centers will be uninhabitable. Get him down. Get him down. Get him down. Very dangerous places. Some small communities would put up barriers. Man said no. You're going to find things along the route that are going to be useful to you, and you're going to take them. You're going to have to forage, which is a nice word for looting. The hardest thing in the world for anybody would be to take another life. Now, we all know that EBT is on the computer systems that, af that affect millions of Americans. When you're talking about food, you're talking about people not being able to eat. People are going to go ape crazy. They're going to they're do some crazy stuff when they can't get their food. Americans, you, do you know how many people actually are dependent on food stamps right now and welfare? We're talking about uh, the WIC system. We're talking about the EBT system. And who knows, it could even affect the housing. Uh, if there's nobody going to get their money uh, from the government, this, there's going to be some crazy stuff coming. This could be their way of strong-arming uh, the process, the political process, to get the Obamacare health care through as well, to try to get Americans up in arms to blame the Republicans. Who knows, maybe the Republicans are going to take the blame for this. You know how the administration is great at doing that, allowing some big crisis and then pointing the finger. Well, we couldn't do it because the Republicans, they just didn't, wouldn't allow it. So, you know, now we're in a shutdown and now we can't, well, now we don't have EBT and now we don't have, you know, uh, you can't get your benefits. So. They're saying that the U.S. Department of Agriculture is saying that be prepared, you know, states need to be prepared in November for the complete stoppage of, you know, food stamps, basically. You know, states need to be prepared in November for the complete stoppage of you know food stamps basically you know the states need to be prepared in November for the complete stoppage of you know food stamps basically That I went to a city called Lorraine, so bright and 
so sad And when I enter the gates of the city My Lord met me there They carried me from mansion to mansion And oh, what a sight I saw Oh, but I said I wanted to see Jesus, the one who died for us all. Oh, I bow on my knees. I cry holy to the Lamb of God. Holy to the Lamb of God. Holy to. big exercise here and the way it sounds um, it can involve like uh, it's going to involve government agencies in the United States Canada and Mexico of course uh, the NAU there North American Union and then they give you a link for a, they go into the story and there's a link in here for a PDF from uh, the North American Electric uh, Re uh, Reliability Corporation, uh, they call it NERC, N-E-R-C, and it says NERC will host GridX 2013 on November 13th through the 14th, 2013, North American-wide distributed play exercise, executive policy trigger, tabletop exercise on 14th of November. And then you look at the PDF here and it tells you all the objectives of this drill coming up. Uh, like for one, validate the current readiness of the electricity in industry uh, to respond to a security incident incorporating lessons learned from GRID X 2011. Uh, assess, test, and validate existing uh, command, control, and communications plans and tools for NERC and its stakeholders. Identify potential improvements in physical and cybersecurity plans, programs, and responder skills. And number four, evaluate senior leadership policy doctrine and triggers in response to major grid reliability issues. And like I said, I'll put a link to this too below. 
So I just uh, kind of wanted to keep everybody updated on, uh, on what I'm seeing here. You know, this could be something. It could be just a regular drill. But, you know, I don't trust when government has drills, especially when it's got to do with Canada and Mexico, too. Like I said, that's the North American Union. But, again, I will put all links below. This has been Endgame, beginning at www.com.